Uh, I'm going to start uh, in Joshua chapter 7. I eventually get there. Um, but this, what I'm finishing to teach on, is something that Miss Wendy's already taught on. Well, this happened to me back in 2012. So that's how long it's been since Miss Wendy's taught on this. But, um, well, let me, just, let me just start where I'm going to. I'm going to read uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse two, uh, 26. And, but we will eventually make it to Joshua chapter 7. But Deuteronomy 7, 26 says, Do not bring any detestable object into your home, for then you will be destroyed like them. You must utterly test such things, for they are set apart for destruction. Jesus was teaching them that things... <clears throat> there are certain things you're not supposed to have in your house, right? We know this, right? There are certain things that you shouldn't be allowed in your house, right? How does th some of these things get to your house, get inside your house? The music we listen to, the TV shows that we watch, um, what else? Something we might have done that we didn't realize what we have done, right? So he's telling the, the, um, the Israelites here to make sure that you keep your house pure, right? Uh and then in Joshua chapter 6, verse 17, uh, they were going into Jericho, and every, he, the Lord told them, said, Everything that must be completely destroyed as an offer to the Lord, only Rahab the prostitute and others in her house will be spared, for she protected the spies. It says, Don't take any of the things that are set apart for destruction, or you yourself will be completely destroyed, and you will bring trouble to the camp of Israel. Everything made of silver, gold, and bronze, and iron is sacred for the Lord, and must be brought into his treasury. He told them when they were going into Jericho, that everything is supposed to be destroyed except for the, the gold, the silver, the bronze, and all that was supposed to be saved for him, right? So now here we come up to um, Joshua chapter 7, and this is what I wanted to talk about. Um, Joshua chapter 7, the children of Israel are going against Ai. Now they've already went through Jericho, and they've already destroyed everything at Jericho. I mean, they just, you know, they marched around. How many times they marched around? Seven. Total? Okay, 13 times. 13 times. I know. I, I didn't say it right. <laughs> How many times they marched around total? Yeah, right. They did march seven on that the last day, but right. So they marched around Jericho for six days, kept their mouth shut, and on the seventh day, they marched around seven times, blow the trumpet. So now they're all puffed up and ready to go, right? But in um, chapter seven, the Israelites are talking about, let's see, where's it at? Right here. Um, they're getting ready to go up against Ai. And then at verse 1 it says, But Israel had violated the instructions about the sacred things set apart for the Lord. A man named Achan had stolen some of the things uh, that were dedicated to the Lord. So the, anger was, the Lord was angry with the Israelites, for Achan the son of Kamei, a descendant of Zimri, the son of Zerai, from the tribe of Judah. So Achan had kept some of the things that were set apart for the Lord. And it said the Lord is mad. right? But they didn't know this at the time. Uh, Joshua didn't know that Achan had kept some things, right? So the men go scout out Ai, and they say, well, look, it's not a big deal. Uh, we only need about 3,000 words. In verse 4, it says approximately 3,000 words were sent. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's back up just a little bit. It said in verse 3, it says, there's no need for all of us to go up there. It won't take more than two or 3,000 men to attack Ai, since there's so few of them. Don't make everybody struggle to go up there. So they're just telling them, look, we got this. All we need is about 3,000 men, give or take, for, so whatever, and we, we can go partake Ai. Well, Joshua agrees with what was said, right? And then in verse 4, it says, So approximately the 3,000 warriors were sent, but they were soundly defeated, and the men of Ai scattered all the Israelites from the town gates as far as the quarries, and they killed about 36 who retreated down the slopes. And the Israelites were paralyzed with fear at the turn of events, and their courage melted away. They just got their hineys whooped, Right? But they were all puffed up and ready to go because they thought, ah, no big deal. They said, all we need is about 3,000 men. No big deal. We got this. So now, Joshua was in, in this right here, at this particular verse, Joshua is wanting to know what happened. In Joshua chapter, uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 6, right? He starts talking to the elders. He's like, what happened? All right? He's like, what the world's going on? I thought we had this thing under control, right? Have you ever tried to do something and thought you had it under control? And the Lord says, eh. You ever try to step out on your own and not consult with the Lord? And the Lord goes, eh. All right? Or has the Lord told you to do something and you didn't do it? And all of a sudden, eh. <laughs> it happens to you. Right? So, is it important to, cons yeah. is it important to consult with the Lord? Yes. Absolutely. Why? 
He's the one to give us a guidance direction. What did you say, Bill? He's the one who made us. He's the one who made us, right? Does he not know the end from the beginning? That's right. Does he not know how to get us from point A to point B? Mm -hmm. All right. Does he not have the roadmap for our life? Yeah. Right? So does he know where he wants you to go? Yeah. Right? All right. I'm going to tell on some of us, but some of us men, sometimes you get lost. <laughs> yeah. And you're trying to drive around. I got this, baby. Just pull over and ask direction. Now I got this. I'll GPS it. No big deal. I, you know, I got all this smart technology, all this other stuff, and I'll, I'll get there. Mm -hmm. You know, two hours later, if you'd have just stopped and asked for directions, how fast would you got there, right? Mm -hmm. Shelly's like, just pull over and ask. Oh, I get it. I get it. I basically get there. I might not have got there the fast as I could have. But it's the same thing, right? If I'd have just consulted uh, with Shelly or if I'd have stopped and asked for directions, it would have been that much faster, right? Or if I'd have stopped and asked the Lord, right? But I got this, right? I can get there. I got this under control. So he knows the end from the beginning. He knew that this was fixing to happen to you. He knew that you were going to get that job, just like you were talking about. He knew that these things are going to come in our lives. He knew that you were going to run into Shelly at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> and that y'all would have to have this little conversation with each other anyway. <laughs> She's going to ignore me. <laughs> anyway, they, they met at Walmart. Shelly walked by like this right here. <laughs> anyway. Telling on you, I'm sorry. <laughs> but so he he knows where we're going, right? <laughs> right? So anything that happens to you, is it a surprise to God? Huh? Not to him. Not to him, right? He knew this was gonna happen. He knew that today on what, July 19th, that I was gonna teach this Sunday school class. I didn't know that. If he'd asked me five years ago, I said, No, I ain't. Mm -hmm. If he'd asked me six months ago, I said, No, I ain't. <laughs> No, ma'am. No, sir. Not me. No. -uh. But God had been preparing me to be here today, right? Because of the things that have been happening in my life for the last two or three months, my, I don't know, attitude towards this whole teaching ministry, everything else has really shifted. Six months ago, I was not the right person to be up here. I mean, I just tell you, I was not. Thomas had a lot of stuff going on inside here that, that Thomas had to deal with. But today I can tell you I'm supposed to be up here. I know it for a fact. You know, I know that for a fact. Because I can look back over the last couple months and I can see how God's done this, He's done this, He's done this, He's done this to get me to where I am right here today. Right? So it's a good thing when you know you are where God has led you, right? When you know you're walking where God has divinely led you. It's a good thing. Why? Because that's where your protection is. That's where your provision is. Right? That's where God's, if you got, if God has got you in the palm of his hands, then what can really come against you? What can really happen that God doesn't already know about? Right? So when you experience, you know, put whatever you got in that box, when you experience this right here, God goes, I knew that. I knew that was going to happen. God knew Jeremy was coming in on that day. He knew that. You didn't know that. We don't know that. We don't know when Dalton's coming in. We don't know when, uh, gosh, I just forgot your son's name. Matt, we don't know when Matt's coming in. But God knows it. Absolutely. So do we quit petitioning God? No. Mm -mm. No. Do we quit asking God to, to intervene? Absolutely not. Do we just let God just do whatever God's going to do and us just sit idly by? I guess you can. But you're probably not going to get what you've been believing God for. Right? If you're not believing God for the for the big things, then he's like, well, you must not must be, must not be too concerned about it, right? How many's prayed to God? You don't have to raise your hand, but how many's prayed to God about those things that are on your heart in the last 24 hours? How many's actually sat down and fervently prayed about those things that are on your heart? Go raise your hands. Okay, well, okay. Because if it doesn't concern you, it probably doesn't concern God. Yikes! <laughs> I don't know why I said that, but I just said it. <laughs> So we have to be about what the Father wants us to do. Let me get back over here. I'm sorry. I done traversed down the wrong rabbit trail. All right, so Joshua and the elders, 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 yeah, they're elders. Chapter 7, verse 6. Joshua and the elders of the, of the Israel tore their clothing in dismay and threw dust on their heads and bowed their face before the ground of the Ark of the Covenant uh, until the Lord that evening. Then Joshua cried out, O sovereign God, why have you brought us across, you brought us across the Jordan River and you're going to let the Amorite kill us? If we'd only... Be content to stay on the other side. Lord, what can I say now that Israel has fled from his enemies? <laughs> Joshua, he's, mad. he's upset. He's like, God, why have you, 
Why couldn't I just been content to stay where I was? And now you don't really know what's going on, right? And then in verse uh, 10, <laughs> he says, But the Lord said unto Joshua, Get up. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> he says, Get up. <laughs> and Joshua's like, uh, Okay. He says, he says, Why are you lying on your face like this? Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. <laughs> so when you get that, Get up. Uh, yes, Lord. <laughs> You're not doing what I told you to do. Uh, okay. What was I supposed to be doing? Well, go back and do what I told you to do. Uh, yes, Lord. <laughs> how many's ever had that? You don't have, you don't have to raise your hands. <laughs> right? He says, get up. Why are you laying on your face for? Why are you crying? The people have sinned. <laughs> he says, bring the clans together tomorrow and I'll show you what happened. Let's see. Uh, verse uh, 11. They have stolen some of the things that I have commanded you must be set apart from me. And they have not only stolen it, but they've lied about it. Uh-oh. Not only stolen it, but they've lied about it. Right? Did you do anything wrong? Uh-uh. <laughs> I mean, he's done that. I mean, I was, you know, I was little. <laughs> I, I, I might have been a little bit taller. <laughs> Did you do that? Uh-uh. Not me. Uh-uh. <laughs> right? So look. Let's see, verse 12. And that's why the Israelites are running from their enemies in defeat. For now the Israelite itself will be set apart for destruction. I will not remain with you any longer unless you destroy the things among you that were set apart for destruction. So says you've got to destroy those things. Wait a minute, that don't sound right. You've got to get rid of those things that I've set apart for destruction. I'm going to jump on down to verse um, 14. It says, in the morning, present yourself before the tribes, and I'll point it out. Now, right here, let's get on down to 16. So, uh, 7, 16. It says, Achan sin. It says, early the next morning, Joshua brought the tribes of Israel before the Lord, and the tribe of Judah was singled out. Now, here's Achan, and he knows something's wrong. Right? <clears throat> and the Lord says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to single them out. I'll bring everybody before me, and I'm going to single them out. Right? So, you imagine how Achan feels right about now. He knows something's wrong. But he, but he doesn't stand up and say, I'm the one. So you got 12 tribes of Israel, and he tri called the tribe of Judah. He goes, ooh, that's my tribe. Right? <laughs> so it goes on down, and it says, let's see. Then the clans of Judah came forward, and the clan of Zerah was singled out. And he goes, ooh, that's my clan. So God's trying to give him a chance to say, it's me. Right? But Achan keeps quiet this whole time. Called out Judah, called out Zerah. All right. Then every member of Zerah's family were brought forward by person by person, and then Achan was singled out. You imagine having your brothers and whatever were stand beside you, and they're going, "Nope, nope, nope, nope," and you're about right here. Nope, nope, nope. Then it gets to Achan, and Achan says, "Yes, I'm the one that done it." So he tells them that I'm the one, and it says, uh, verse 19, it says, "My son, give glory to the Lord, the Lord God of Israel, by telling the truth and make a confession, and tell me what you have done. Don't hide it from me." The verse 20 says, it says, I have sinned. It is true. Uh, the Lord God of Israel, uh, against the Lord God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw beautiful robes and 200 coins and a gold bar. And then I wanted them so much that I took them for myself and then hid them beneath the ground. So Joshua and the men uh, went to the tent to make a search. They ran to the tent and found the stolen goods hidden there, just like Achan had said. And the silver was buried beneath the rest. And they took the things from the tent, brought it to Joshua and all the Israelites, and they laid them before the ground in the presence of the Lord. So now he's, now he's confessed his sin, right? He's told him. He's caught. He's red-handed. I mean, you're caught with your hand in the cookie jar, right? Anybody ever done that? Don't get no cookie. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, chocolate love your face. Uh-uh. <laughs> right? <laughs> but now Achan, everything is sent out. Uh, and in verse... Uh, let's get on down to verse 25. So then Josh said to Achan, Why have you brought this terrible trouble on us? The Lord will now bring trouble on you. And all the Israelites stoned them. Achan and his family they were burned. They piled up a great heap of stones on Achan and it remains there today. That is why the place has been called the Valley of Trouble ever since the Lord. Um, in verse 24, it says, Achan's silver, robe, gold, sons, daughters, cattle, sheep, donkey, tent, everything that they owned were brought there. The Lord destroyed everything that he had. Everything. Basically wiped out his name. Right? 
Wiped out his family, everything. <laughs> what if God treated us that way today? How many of us would still be here? How many, would, how many people would actually be in the church? Now, we might not have stolen something and done something like this right here or take something that was set apart for the Lord, but we've done things that are wrong, that are, that are sin against God, right? How many of us would still be in church today? I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, Miss Ella would. I think he'd still be here, wouldn't he? <laughs> you hope so? <laughs> right. So here's, here's a story I want to tell y'all. Wendy taught this, it was back in 2012. It's probably back in early uh, January time frame. And when she taught this story, I had been praying to God would show me the things in my life that don't give him glory or that I need to take care of. And I was working the door uh, uh, greeting and then uh, another gentleman had said that he went to a hardware store and paid for a screwdriver that he had stole back when he was a teenager. So all this is going through my mind about the story about Aiken, about getting the things out of your um, closet that you might need to get rid of. And then he tells a story about paying for a screwdriver that he'd stole when he was 16 years old. And the Lord reminded me about some baseball cards. When I was 16, um, I was a thief. Shock. Sorry. It's true. It's true. But I wasn't in right standing with the Lord. I thought I was going to heaven, but I really wasn't sure. I was raised in church, but you still, you know, it was just kind of a gray area for me. But at the time, I, the fruit was not there. I'll just put it to you that way. And I worked at J&M Foodland uh, in Boaz. And then at night we would close and there were, uh, we would get boxes of baseball cards in by the box full. Now I'm talking about the little package, I'm the whole box. And the manager would go to the back and I'd grab a box and just walk out, put it in my car, come back in and carry on like it was nothing. I still six boxes of baseball, baseball cards like that. And I just told my mom and dad that I was working extra, made a little extra money, and I was paid for them. So here I was. I was a thief, and I was lying about it. And the Lord brought that, that part of my life back to my remembrance. He said, you got to make that right. Oh, God, that was back in 87. God, that's 25 years ago. He said, make it right. Oh, gosh. So when you ask God to show you things in your life, be careful. Mm -hmm. Don't ask questions you don't want the answer to. God, show me the things in my life that are, don't please you. Okay, boy, here they come. And this was just one of two or three. So now I have got to go take these baseball cards back to the manager of Daniel Foodland. Now, the manager was there when I was there. They're already gone, so it's totally different people. You know, all this has changed over the last 25 years. And I didn't want to do it. I'll just be honest with you. I was nervous. I didn't know what the guy was going to do. Didn't know who he was. Didn't know what his demeanor was or anything. But I wrestled with it for about a month or so. When God told me on a Tuesday, he said, Friday's your day. Okay. <laughs> so he said, so he told me, Friday's your day. Yes, sir. So that Friday morning, when I got ready to go to work, I, I still got the baseball cards. I mean, I brought one of them. I still got them. <laughs> huh? Now hold on. Uh, I, hold on. I, I made it right. Hold on. I'll tell you. I still got the baseball cards. And I took the box of baseball cards with me when I went to the store. Walked in and told him I wanted to meet, meet with the manager. He said, well, he's in his back in his office. I said, okay, I know where it's at. Oh, yeah. The box is uh, a moving box. That's a big moving box. It's a good two foot by two foot, just full. I mean, I'm talking full of baseball cards. So I didn't have them with me when I walked in, but I had them in a the truck. So I got to talk to the manager. When, when I get back there, the manager had uh, one of his uh, workers back there, and I said, Kelly, can I talk to you for a minute? I don't think I knew his name at the time. Well, maybe I did. I don't remember. I said, can I speak to you? And he said, sure. And he asked the gentleman to step out. Now, here I am fixing to tell this guy what I did 25 years ago, and I have no idea what's going to happen. But I'd already made up my mind. Lord already told me Friday was your day, and you've got to make this thing right. 
And no matter what happens, now I'm going to put on my big boy pants and just take the consequences, right? I'm going to step up and do what God has told me to do. So I began to tell the gentleman that I used to work there back in 87, and that I was stealing baseball cards, and he didn't really, he didn't really say anything. And I told him how I was doing it and everything else. And I told him that the, that the Lord had spoke to me and told me to come back and make all this right. And he said, Amen. And I went, Oh, thank you, God, he's a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. He said, Amen. And I was like, Whoo! Okay, there might be mercy. Oh, God, there might be some mercy here. But I didn't know if I was going to get called to cops. I, you know, what is the statute of limitations on you know, stolen property? I, you know, I don't know. All this is running through my mind, and that's why I didn't want to deal with it. But when he said, he, when he said Amen, he said, uh, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I figured they're about $20 a piece, give or take. Uh, and I got six boxes, so I figured it's about $120 what I owe the store. And he told me, he said, in his 30 plus years of grocery work, and he said he's never had anybody to come back and do something like that. He said it just, it just floored him. He, he was just like, wow, I mean, you're really doing this, you know. But to the... Uh, So the people don't understand that, you know, it's a very foreign concept to people, right? I mean, you walk back to somebody that you told them, I don't know, called them a bad word 25 years ago, and the Lord told me, i got to tell you I'm sorry. Dude, I don't remember you even telling it to me. Well, I remember, right? I remember saying it to you. You know? And that's where God had taken me. He said, I, Kelly didn't really know what to do. So he said, all right. So he went up to the register. He did all the math and figured it up and rang them up for me and gave me a receipt for the baseball cards. I said, here, you can have the baseball cards. I got them in my car, truck. He says, no, you keep them. I said, well, I'm going to throw them away because I don't want them. He said, no, you keep them. You paid for them. Okay. I got the receipt. It's in my box of baseball cards, and it's marked March 16th, 2012. So, no, this is not stolen property. It's been paid for. <laughs> 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 oh, and why am I telling you all this stuff, right? Because the Lord had told them, don't take things that are set apart from me. These things that I've set apart, don't you put your hand on them. And then when they found out there was something wrong, then Achan didn't have the courage to step forward and say, it was me. Right? So ask God what's in your heart that he, that, that he needs to deal with. Now, don't ask God if you're not willing to do what He tells you to do. <laughs> right? You've got to be willing to do what God tells you to do because when He says, Son, take care of this, He's not playing. And there's a purpose for it, and I'm about to get to that point next, but there's a purpose for everything that God tells you to do. It is for your own good. Now, me as a natural dad, I try to do right by my kids and try to teach them and teach them how to go, where to go, what to do, and try to keep them straight. And that's in my natural ability. But God knows everything about you. And He knows where you need to go. So do you not think God is going to steer you in the right direction? I mean, He's not going to just let you just, Oh, here we go, in a circle again, in a circle again. You know, right? He wants you to go the right direction. Why? He loves you. Loves you? What would you say, Renee? He loves you. Okay. I didn't, right. He loves us. Right? He knows the end result. Does he not know the fast way to get there? Right? How long would it take in the, is the children of Israel to make it to the promised land if they'd have went God's way? 11 days. 11 days. I wonder if anybody read that before. Mm -hmm. Right? If they'd have taken God's route, it would only take 11 days to get to the promised land. It took them 40 years. That's a heck of a detour. <laughs> so, I wanted God to show me the short route. Right? Get me there as fast as I can go. Because he said he turned them around because he, for fear that they wouldn't know how to fight. He knew what was in their hearts. And if they had went into the promised land, they'd have to fight, but they didn't have the courage to fight. So he actually took them a different way on purpose. But then they murmured and complained, and that's what started the whole 40 years. Right? But God wants you to go the right way. He knows the 11-day path. Right? How many has been dealing with something for more than 11 days? All right. I've got things I've been dealing with more than 11 days. And what if God said, if you walk this way, I, got to, I could have had it done in 11 days for you. 
<laughs> you know, now we look back and go, gosh, if I'd have got rid of that in 11 days, that'd have been so much more glorious, right? Than walking around the mountain, you know, 40 years, 40 days, 40 minutes, 40 seconds even. <laughs> I don't want to go, I don't want to go on the wrong path, right? So, uh, John chapter 14, verse 27. It says, I'm leaving with the gift of peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you, I'm going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really love me, you'll be happy that I'm going to the Father who is greater than I am. I've told you these things before they would happen, so you'd be so that when they happen, you would believe. I don't have much more time to talk to you because the rule of this world approaches. He has no power over me. Remember that. But I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's be going. Verse 30, he says, He has no power over me. Why did Satan have no power over Jesus? Because there was no sin in Jesus' life. Satan is the father of sin, right? So when Jesus says he has no power over me, or I think the King James says he has nothing in me. I don't think I remember how it said. Basically, he was saying, Jesus was saying that I am perfect. Satan has no way to connect with me and cause me to do things wrong. I feel in my heart that that thing that I had done back 25 years ago was a hook that Satan had in my life and that he could use that against me. But when I brought it out into light and told Kelly, the uh, manager, and got everything right with the Lord, it took that power that Satan would have had over me. It took it away from him. He can't use that over me no more. I've got that under the blood. It, I confessed it before the Lord, and at the time, if I'd have died, I, I truly believed I'd have went to heaven. No doubt about it. But to where I'm, to get to where I'm going, God says, you've got to come to a higher level. You come to a higher level, you've got to have less baggage. And that was something I had to deal with. Because at some point, I think it would have came up. And now when somebody says anything to me about it, I said, well, I went and talked to the manager, told him what I was doing, got everything taken care of, and now it's, it's covered, right? So Jesus said, you have no power over me. Now Satan has no power over me with that. Now there's other things I've went and confessed too. I had a list. <laughs> About six or seven different things I had to go take care of. And I made it through the first six or seven pretty easy. Believe it or not, that was the second to last thing that I had to take care of. And there was one thing even I thought was even worse than that. You're like, gosh, what could be worse than that, right? <laughs> I, had, I had told a lie about a friend of mine when I was about 16 or 17 years old. And then when I told him what I'd said, he didn't even remember what I even said. It took me almost a year before I ever called Ricky and told him, that's the guy's name. It took me a year to get the courage to call him and tell him. But he didn't even remember the situation. He didn't even, he's like, man, I don't even know what you're even talking about. I said, dude, you don't remember the, the tape and me telling this? And we got in trouble and my, my, my sister-in-law, she went all out of shape. That was his sister. She got all been out of shape about it. I said, man, I don't remember what you're even talking about. But it went for him. Obviously, it was for me, right? <laughs> it was sure to make me feel better. Well, all right, Ricky. We good? Yeah, we good. All right. Woo! That list is over with. But now, now God says, all right, <laughs> there might be more coming. <laughs> so don't think you've ever arrived. <laughs> Has anybody arrived? Okay. All right, I am in the right crowd. <laughs> ah, so <laughs> he has no power over me. Remember that. That's what Jesus said. He has no power over me. And as long as we're walking in Christ, Satan will have no power over you. Right? Whatever he brings your way, I don't care what it is. I don't care what type of hell he might bring to your household. He has no power over you. Mm. Mm. He has no power over you. Remember that. He has no power over you. Confess that. He has no power over me. When you get down to that tough part of your life, when it ain't going the way you want it to go, when everything's all jumbled up in your brain, He has no power over me.
Mm. You can have as much or as little of it as you want. You determine your walk with God. Sanctification, purification, and holiness. You can have as much or as little of it as you want. You determine your walk with God. He spoke that to me one day in prayer. You can have as much of me as you want. Sanctification, purification, and holiness. You can come as clean as you want to be before the Lord. How clean do you need to be? I don't know. How deep do you want to go in God? Where do you want to go in God? How high do you want to go in God? Boy, y'all been quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you want to go in God? How deep do you want to go? How high do you want to go? Whatever analogy you want to use. I want to be in the deep water. I want to be on top of the mountain. Nobody, you might like being in the valley? Okay. <laughs> Nobody wants to be in the valley. But he said trials are coming. Right? They're coming. But it's how you endure the trial that determines your walk with Christ. He said, Peter, Satan, we request to sift you as wheat but he says i have prayed for you so that your faith would be strong he didn't pray that the sifting wouldn't come he said i pray that your faith would be strong when the sifting comes yeah we like that feel good gospel but this is the real this is the real deal all right <laughs> um the further you isolate yourself from the things of the world the closer you come to him the more you get rid of self, the closer you're going to get with God, right? Was it, uh, come on, help me out here. I must decrease that he increases. All, right. All of you and none of me just want to be like Jesus. And when we pray stuff like that, he says, all right, boys. <laughs> when he said, Satan has no power over me, he says, I got to get rid of some things in your life. You got to change the way you're doing some things. You got to change the way you're confessing. You got to change the way you're talking. You got to change some things in your life. Anybody like change? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> I got one second ahead. No. The only change that's guaranteed is change. <laughs> Look, it's going to change. It's going to be different, right? But thank God for that. He loves you just the way you are. He loves you just the way you are. But he loves you so much that he won't leave you the way you are. You know, God accepts you exactly where you are right now. The sinnest, the dirtiest, nastiest sinner of all sinners comes in and he's made righteous right then and there. He's just as holy before the Lord as you are. But he says, son, I can't leave you like that. You've got to come up higher. You've got to come up to a new level. By shaking her head, yes, but <laughs> come on. <laughs> so, um, I will grant you, I will grant your heart's desire because your heart is turned towards me. I will grant your heart's desire because your heart is turned towards me. We're praying for all these things and we're praying whatever it is. But if your heart's desires the same thing as God's desires, then He will grant you the desires of your heart. If you got a God-like heart, remember we talked about the transformation? If your heart is transforming the image of Christ, then He can grant you the desires of your heart because your desires are going to be pure before Him. Your desires are going to be what He wants you to have. Your desires are going to be towards the things of Christ. Right? All right. <laughs> Down to my last note, so y'all gonna start talking. <laughs> All right, I got two more notes. God, do whatever it takes to have more of you in my life. And I heard from God, are you willing to endure the cost? And I said, yes, Lord, by your grace, I'll endure the cost. And then I said, show me the cost. God, do whatever it takes to have more of you in my life. And then God spoke to me and said, are you willing to endure the cost? I don't know what it's going to cost you. I don't know what it's going to cost me. Is it worth the cost, though? 
answer should be yes. <laughs> is it worth the cost? Absolutely. Why? The end result. Because God knows what's best for you, correct? Is it worth the cost? Absolutely. Is it, is it worth the... Whatever you endure, whatever you want to call it, to get to where you need to go in Christ. Is it worth it? Absolutely. And then Luke eleven thirty five 35, it says, Make sure that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. If you are filled with light, with no dark corners, then your whole life will be radiant as though a floodlight were filling you with light. If you are filled with light, with no dark corners. I ask God about the dark places in my heart. Show me the dark places inside my heart. Yeah. Uh, uh. Because I am not qualified to look at Thomas. Because I know how bad Thomas is. I don't even trust Thomas's judgment. Because Thomas might go, Ooh, I'm doing it. I got this thing under control. And Lord says, no, you don't. <laughs> it's like, you know, Joshua said, get up. They're sitting in the camp. Why are you laying down on your face for? I love that. <laughs> God says, get up. What you laying down there crying for? I don't know. <laughs> You're not doing what I told you to do. Yes, sir. <laughs> you got dark places in your heart you need to deal with. Okay. <laughs> right? Oh, come on. <laughs> it's not that bad, is it? I'm sorry. <laughs> Anybody got any input? Come on, we got about two minutes left. You're talking about how when we when we come before God and we ask for we and we ask God to grant the desires of our heart and we just pour it all out before God and it's yes, total and pure and everything. Yes, sir. And God knows what we want. Sometimes the hardest question to answer is when. Yeah. <laughs> because we want it yesterday. Now, right. We want it on our timetable, and we in our humanness are so screwed up and so messed up, we forget that our timing is not God's timing, mm -hmm. and God's timing is certainly not our timing. <laughs> right. And I know in my life I'm guilty of that. Uh huh. I mean, I'm guilty. I'm. I've, I've said to God, you know, I've waited long enough. I've waited. I mean, it's been past time, God. Why not? Right. Why not? When? Yeah. And only God can answer that for me. I can't answer it myself. Right. So that's a matter of still giving it to God and trusting it. You've got to. I mean, what other choice is there, Bill? There is no choice. I mean, what other, whatever avenue can you take? Whatever, what is, what is a, another position you could actually stand on? Well, if we go on our, on our own fleshly attitude, oh, of course, we go on of course. Our own selfish attitude. That, okay, you want it, you got it, but it's going to yeah. cost you. All right. Yeah, it's like those Israelites, you know, it's like, well, I'm tired of those manna. Give me food, give me meat, give me something good to eat. God said, okay, you want it, you got it, but it's going to cost you. And, and, you want, and they want to pay for it in the long run because they succumb to their own fleshly desires of, we want it now. Right. <laughs> this is the weirdest analogy. Remember, Remember Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory? Yeah. That little, that little selfish bratty girl is wanting the golden goose. I want the golden goose now. I don't care how. I want it now. It's like, Meow. yeah. And she went down, but she was a bad egg. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, this is kind of the same thing, you know. We in our flesh say, we don't care how. I want it now. And God's saying, okay, you want it now? You got it. It's gonna cost you. All right. Unless you <coughs> trust me. He's okay. He's okay, Renee. Right. And that's the that's the whole thing. Yeah. Trust me to deliver it to you. Said he gave them so much quail that they they, they, they gorged themselves and threw up. And got sick. And, and made them died. sick. Yes, Angie. The thing about sin is it not only affects you, but mm -hmm. it affects all those around you too. And the right. consequences of it. It's not just for yourself, it's for all those around you. Well, Shelly can tell you that... Uh, my attitude is not always correct. <laughs> and what you see today is not what goes on Monday through Saturday. Uh, 
I have a lot of things I deal with. You know, <coughs> and we come to church and glory to God, hallelujah, and then, you know, go back Monday through Saturday and, uh, <laughs> but you got to walk it out, right? <laughs> you got to keep going, right? All right. Anybody else? Would that look like the same way that I wanted God to heal me? Yes, ma'am. And um, but I wanted right then. Yes, ma'am. And I just kept talking to Him and asked Him, you know, Lord, why this is me? Why is I gotta go through this? Why do I have to go through with it? And I just kept on praying and praying, and all at once I said, well, look, I said, I'm going to put it in your hand, and it's up to you to do whatever you see fit to do. Right. And I thank God this day that I'm a lot, a lot better than what I used to be. Good. <laughs> Good, Miss Ella. Uh, anybody else? Lord, we thank you for the word that's been deposited in our hearts, Father God. I pray, Father God, it goes in each and every one of us, Father God. It produces a 36 and 100-fold return, Father God. We thank you for your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.